to Vitality Made Simple, the podcast that empowers you to more fully enjoy the relationships in your life. When you feel good, you're going to, you're going to have better relationships. And uh, we talk about that a lot. And today I've got Dr. Stephanie Sinef. Uh, this is a podcast you're going to want to share far and wide because it affects every single person and it affects every facet of your relationships. You're going to totally understand that when we get finished talking. Um, Dr. Sinef is a a, a, a research scientist from MIT. She has four degrees, including a doctorate from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And, you know, you don't have to be from Oklahoma to know that is a big deal, a very <laughs> big deal. Um, she uh, is truly one of my heroes. I, I learned about her back in 2015 in a master's program in toxicology, and she's going to give us so much insight today. Uh, she wrote a book called Toxic Legacy. And as soon as it came out, I bought it. You can see the writing. It's all mm -hmm. marked up, totally marked up because it it's a book everybody needs. There's so much information in there. She breaks everything down. And, and, and this is news you can use. This is news that's truly going to matter for your life, for your relationships, how you feel, for your health span, and for your vitality span. Um, Dr. Sinef is has four sons. She has 11 grandchildren. I loved in her book how her husband, Victor, is the, the love of mm -hmm. her life. I mean, she's a real person and uh, someone I would love to be a neighbor with and and have walk, walk and talks. Um, mm -hmm. So I can't thank you enough, Dr. Sinef, for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You know, you've just been a real innovator um, and, and have been, as I understand, at the intersection of uh, of biology as well as uh, artificial intelligence. And so, you know, you were really digging deep into many of the new, new things that were coming out in technology, but then your focus changed in 2012 and you have become a global expert in the area of glyphosate, an herbicide that is everywhere. It's in our water, it's in our air, it's in our food. Um, tell us what sparked your interest in glyphosate, Dr. Sinef. Yeah, well, it dates back actually many years back when I was uh, young and my, my son, uh, I had a friend who had a, a child who was about the same age as my son and her child had a, got a DBT shot and then had a really bad reaction to the shot. And then um, later on uh, was diagnosed with autism and I sort of connected the two of those together. So I was interested in autism. I was watching it and then I saw the numbers going up starting around 2000. I was noticing every year, oh yeah, more autism, not a problem. We're just diagnosing it more. Don't worry about it. And I was worried about it. So, you know, well, long about 2007, 2008, I said, I got to figure this out. This is weird. And there, you know, most of the research dollars are going towards genetics. It's a genetic disease. And it's not a genetic disease. It's a, if it's going up dramatically, there's something in the environment that's contributing. I imagine people can have certain genes that make them more susceptible, but, but there's an environmental factor for sure. And I wanted to figure out what it was. And I just started is able to transition my research directions very nicely with the same company still supporting my work, which was really lovely. I've had very good support from a computer company in Taiwan. They've been funding my research for many years, for decades actually. So they were happy to have me switch, switch gears. And I really changed my career tremendously in terms of what I was doing uh, from writing code that was precursors to Amazon Echo or, or Siri uh, changed over to studying the environment, looking at st statistical correlations between various toxic uh, exposures and disease, specifically focused on autism, but then expanding out into all kinds of other diseases as well. Um, took me five years of searching. I was looking at, you know, lead and aluminum and um, PCBs I and mean, all the plastics, all these things, trying to figure out what was it that was causing the autism coming up short, but I did figure out my, there's gotta be something about the gut, you know, the autistic kids, they've got gut problems for sure. Constipation, diarrhea, bloating, discomfort. Um, the gut is where it's beginning. That felt that way. Um, and I didn't know what it was in the gut, but I was looking for something they would be eating, you know, or maybe in the drinking water or something like that. And uh, so I happened to be at a conference in um, 2012. Uh, I was at a conference and, and uh, Professor Don Huber was also at the conference. He's retired. He's in his 80s. He's still active. Um, he's an expert on glyphosate. And so he had this talk on glyphosate, two hour presentation on glyphosate at this conference. And I thought, well, what's that glyphosate? I don't know what that is, but let me go listen because this might be related to my, you know, what I'm looking for. And of course I found out glyphosate is Roundup and I knew all about Roundup and 
it's safe. You know, I, I never used it because I don't like to use chemicals, but certainly my neighbors did, you know, and it was, um, and I didn't realize at that time that it's all over the food supply. Um, but he presented and it just fit like a glove between what he was saying that glyphosate could do to our health and what I knew was happening to the autistic kids. It fits so perfectly. I was extremely excited, edge of my seat. And I went back and immediately started uh, studying glyphosate, you know, and, and, and then comparing it with the autism, trying to connect the dots, figure that out. I'm convinced, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced at this point, it's not the only cause of autism. It's not the only cause of the epidemic, but it is the main cause of the epidemic, I believe. And it works synergistically with all kinds of other chemicals to make them more toxic than they would otherwise be. So it's, it's a really nasty situation that we're in. It's pervasive in our food supply. The government doesn't care. They think it's perfect. They've been drunk the Kool-Aid. They think it's perfectly safe because the manufacturer tells them that's the case. Wonderful chemical kills all plants except for those that have been engineered to resist it. Completely harmless to humans. That's hard to believe, you know, that something that kills all plants could be harmless to humans. That's, plants, we have a lot in common with plants. And so, and of course our microbes have even more in common with plants. And the things it does to the plants, it also does to the microbes. And that's where it begins with the disruption of the gut microbiome. Well, that's, I mean, you are so incredible at connecting the dots because um, for our listeners, you know, if you look up glyphosate, you're going to see several articles that are saying it's safe, it's safe, it doesn't cause cancer, it doesn't do this, it's, it only affects plants, humans don't have the same uh, enzymatic pathway that glyphosate uses. Um that's uh, Dr. Senev talks about that in her book, The Shikimate Plat uh, Pathway. But, you know, uh, the devil is in the details, <laughs> as we know, Dr. Yes. Senev. And, ex you know, it, it is true that humans do not have that pathway, right. but our gut microbes have that pathway. And, and now we know, and as we talk about so much, we are dependent on the health of our gut microbes for our health. I mean, it's just key to, to circle back to autism. When I first became aware of autism, um, we, we had friends that had children that were suffering and the whole family was suffering. So we uh, looked a lot at, at probiotics and of course, mm -hmm. probiotics helped in some courses, of course, didn't solve the problem, but that should have been a huge clue to something, you know, disrupting um, the gut, the gut microbiome. So tell us about what you've found in terms of what the bacteria need to do, how they're inhibited from doing that, and how that's impacting every single listener. Right. It's a complicated story. And I spent a long time studying uh, to write my chapter on the gut. There's a whole chapter devoted to the gut in my book. And uh, I'm proud of that chapter because I that's feel like I kind great. of worked things out in a way that's beyond what... Uh, what I was reading about it, it kind of synthesized a bigger story around what mm -hmm. it's doing to the gut. And it's quite fascinating and very disturbing. And of course it does start with the microbes being harmed by the glyphosate. And then the products that the microbes produce are not being produced in adequate amounts because of the glyphosate. And in particular, the studies showed that the glyphosate especially uh, harmed the beneficial bacteria that are core in the baby's gut. You know, but the bif bifidobacteria, the lactobacillus, those are basically the two major species that inhabit the, the baby's gut. Lactobacillus, of course, help you, helps you digest milk. And the bifidobacteria are very, very important. We're finding more and more about the significance of those two species to our health. And they get knocked down by glyphosate. They're very sensitive. And this allows other species like Clostridia, Clostridia, Desulfovibrio, uh, uh, Wadsworthia, what is it called? Uh, uh, <laughs> I lost the name. Um, but bilophila, yeah, Wadsworth, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. all those, all those that we see uh, on stool testing that are overgrowth and that are autoimmune inducing bacteria. I mean, your, your book helps it make so much sense. Like why in the heck somebody's trying their best, you know, taking probiotics. Um, we have here sort of a, what I call our culture culture. We do fermented yogurt and try to help people get started on uh, cultivating good bacteria in their guts with, um, you know, homemade, homemade, uh, fermentation. But when we've got this glyphosate working against us, I mean, I can, you know, I can just remember, you know, being out spraying my garden and our kids were playing in the grass and, you know, just all right there at once, never having any idea what that right. was doing to us. They don't and, give you any indication. 
they don't even tell you particularly to be careful when you're using it. So it's really, really bad, especially with people, young children, you know. Yes. Well, tell our listeners about um, the specific amino acids, the aromatic amino acids that are, um, are hurt by glyphosate and why, why right. we need those so much. Yeah, so the aromatic amino acids are three of the essential, well, they're essential amino acids, meaning that our body can't, our cells can't make them. And of course, we can't make them because we don't have the shikimate pathway. That's how they're made through that pathway that glyphosate disrupts. And uh, they are, um, they're, they're called tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. That's the names of them. And they're very special. They're, 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 uh, they have these rings, and the rings are very important in what they can do. And they're precursors to all kinds of really important biologically active molecules including uh, serotonin, melatonin, uh, the thyroid hormone, yeah. and, um, and uh, the skin, skin canning, tanning agent, melanin, um, and dopamine. Uh, you know, dopamine is the movement. Uh, yeah. These are hormones. I mean, these are neurotransmitters, hormones are very, very important. Of course, protecting from skin cancer, the melanin, melatonin for sleep, serotonin for mood, you know, it, it's a mood enhancer. Uh, and also serotonin uh, protects from obesity. Um, it causes it, uh, act less, uh, too little serotonin leads to both obesity and violent behavior depression. So uh, serotonin is super important. And then of course, uh, tryptophan is also a precursor to niacin, which is a very important a B vitamin um, that produces NAD, which is a, a really important molecule in the, in the mitochondria. So there's uh, having deficiencies in those things is really bad. And, and, and because both the plants that are exposed to glyphosate are going to produce less and the uh, microbes in your gut are going to produce less, you're going to be deficient if you're being exposed to uh, glyphosate contaminated foods, you know, just going to be in a big, big trouble with deficiencies in those critical molecules. And of course, they're also um, coding amino acids. So these three are uh, three of the 20 or so uh, amino acids that make up the proteins. The proteins are assembled like beads on a, on a string according to the DNA code. And so these are critical for making the protein. So then certain proteins that have a lot of these amino acids in them are going to be problematic. They won't have enough to make, you know, to make themselves. So there's, that's critical too. So uh, um, that's one problem. And of course, the other problem is those microbes get killed off. Um, the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, you get these clostridia. Um, there's a huge problem with sulfur, which I talk about a lot in my book. Yes. Glyphosate is really messing up the sulfur system. And that's how you end up with a deficiency in methionine. So it's been shown experimentally that glyphosate also um, suppresses methionine synthesis by the microbes. Methionine is the sulfur is the critical sulfur containing amino acid um, that's essential also for methylation pathways. Methionine mm -hmm. has that meth word. Methylation pathways are often really messed up in autistic kids. And that's not only because the methionine is deficient because glyphosate is disrupting the, the microbes ability to make it, but also the, the sulfation pathways that are needed um, for the methionine to be able to do its job are also disrupted. And so um, you get a lot of uh, problems with metabolism um, as a consequence of glyphosate suppressing certain critical enzymes. And just so many people these days have trouble with methylation. I mean, that is, is sort of a, a thing we're seeing all the time. When you, everything you mentioned, Dr. Seneff, makes me think of some piece of relationship. I mean, when people aren't sleeping good, they're going to be grouchy. They're not going to feel good at work. Uh, when people aren't getting serotonin, the happy hormone, you know, they're going to have problems when their guts messed up, they're going to be constipated. And of course that makes people feel terrible or they're going to have diarrhea. Um, when their thyroid's not working, you know, they're, they're feeling badly. And you think about, um, potentially the, well, probably the genetic aspect in autism, uh, so those, everything's uh, magnified exactly, and, and then even for just the, you know, the person who doesn't deal with that genetic problem, it, it's still a huge, huge impact on just daily life. One of the things you mentioned in your, in your book is the increase in fatty liver disease. This has been yes. a shocker to me because like when I was in dental school in the early eighties, uh, anybody who had fatty liver disease, we would assume alcoholism. We would, exactly. it, was, it was always alcoholism. And then we started hearing about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And now that's what we're dealing with. Tell us how glyphosate is impacting that. I, I think it's, I think it's bottom line when it comes to 
Right. And disease. it's been shown in, uh, in studies with, with rats, they exposed them to very low doses of glyphosate and they found that it caused fatty liver disease. And there's a study on humans. They had three different groups, the normal people who were healthy, people who had a milder case and people who had a more severe case. And then they looked at glyphosate in the urine. It, it was amazing to me that they could actually see statistically significant differences among those three groups uh, at, with the level of glyphosate in the urine. Um, you know, associated with the higher levels associated with the worst disease, really remarkable. So I think it's definitely a major factor in this epidemic we're seeing in fatty liver disease. And, uh, you know, it's, it messes up the metabolism in really complicated ways uh, with the liver. And, and what I think is happening is that the fructose is not being properly channeled. Fructose actually can be a precursor for uh, serotonin and that pathway is getting blocked. And so the fructose is not being properly metabolized in the gut. So when you eat a lot of, and of course, high fructose corn syrup, you know, that's corn, that's going to have glyphosate in it. And people are getting a lot of that um, in their diet these days. It's a substitute for plain old cane sugar. And, um, and so that fructose that you're eating doesn't get properly metabolized in the gut. And then it becomes a liver's responsibility to deal with the fructose. And fructose is actually, people don't realize this, but glucose and fructose are both sort of simple sugars and they're in sucrose. And uh, fructose is much, much more, damaging as a glycation agent, causing glycation damage, which is associated with diabetes is much worse than glucose, 10 times as bad I've heard in terms of its ability to cause uh, problems with, you know, oxidizing the fats and causing trouble with, um, with the glyc it causes glycation damage, which then causes the fats to become uh, vulnerable to oxidation and things like that. So you get these nasty glycation products that you have the hemoglobin, you know, when you measure hemoglobin A1C as a way to detect uh, diabetes, um, that's a measure of, of hemoglobin that's been glycated. So it's, it's glycating these proteins and causing trouble. The fructose is doing that because the liver, so the liver is kind of grabbing all this fructose that's coming at it and it has to do something with it. And what the liver does with it is it turns it into fat and then it has to store that fat. And so it ends up being fatty liver as a consequence of the fructose, not because of alcohol. Well, and, and that has to impact detoxification in Lots Absolutely. of ways. Yeah. The liver is really hit hard by glyphosate. And, um, and I talk, I have a whole chapter on the liver actually as well. Oh. So I have a chapter on the gut, a chapter on the liver. And it's, uh, it's fascinating. It's, and there's like 600 references in this book. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, well it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, one of the, a great article that um, I think you've re referenced is the impact of glyphosate on insulin resistance. And of course, that's just a, an increasing problem that affects everything at base level. Uh, tell us what, how glyphosate is impacting our insulin. We can be yeah, thinking we're eating so healthy, eating a lot of vegetables. In fact, I thought about you, Dr. Seneff. Um, I met a friend for dinner the other night trying to get something good. And I had a salad. I know it was, you know, I felt like I had, you know, bring me a, bring me a, a chicken salad with glyphosate. Uh, because, <laughs> I know, know it's so nothing's hard, organic. It? So it's really hard. Yeah. To mm -hmm. avoid it. Unfortunately in our, in the United States, it's very difficult to avoid glyphosate. Um, yeah. The sugar problem is, is, is complicated. And of course, diabetes, I want to say diabetes and obesity are both going up dramatically uh, in, in America in step with the dramatic rise in the use of glyphosate on core crops. It's perfect match. I mean, it's just incredibly mm -hmm amazing how many different um, diseases we're, we're facing right now that are just getting worse and worse. Uh, as I said, the autism, the diabetes, the obesity, the fatty liver disease, and even things like Alzheimer's, you know, and Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. all of these things are going up. Uh, we're getting sicker and sicker every day. And um, we're really burdened with this tremendous healthcare issue in this country. We spent so much money on healthcare. And we, our government refuses to recognize that if we could just get rid of the glyphosate, I think we would really turn things around. We would do a lot better health-wise. And diabetes is a very complex disease and hard to exactly know what's going on. But I have a theory about it that I talked about in my book. And that gets a little bit complicated with the science because this chicken bait pathway we mentioned, and particular enzyme EPSP synthase, in the pathway, the glyphosate disrupts. And I talk about, I have a chapter in my book where I defend my idea that glyphosate is substituting for glycine, the amino acid glycine during protein synthesis. I think this is central to its toxicity. And uh, it's something that the industry is refusing to admit. They say this is not true, even though their own studies support it very, very strongly. So that's quite interesting that they're pushing back on that. So this is a theory, we could say it hasn't been proven, but there's tremendous evidence to support it. And I go, I go into that evidence in my book, including evidence directly from the industry. 
So the um, glyphosate is a glycine molecule. Glycine is one of the coding. It's the smallest coding amino acid. It has no side chains. Glyphosate has no side chains either because it's glycine. What glyphosate has that makes it different is it has something attached to its nitrogen atom. And so the nitrogen atom uh, has this extra stuff which makes it negatively charged, which changes its behavior a lot, makes it soluble, changes the, the biophysics and biochemistry of the glycine molecule when you do that. And so uh, glyphosate actually fits into the little socket that's made to only fit glycine. Glycine is the smallest amino acid, so it has this little small pouch where it needs to fit in the enzyme that's going to do, you know, choose the code glycine, put that one in there. It grabs the glyphosate. The nitrogen is sitting outside of the pocket because it has to hook up to the chain. And it's got the other stuff sitting there too. And the stuff could get in the way. But if you've got small amino acids on the sides, it can fit. And it can especially fit in situations where the protein, where that glycine occurs in the protein at a place where it binds phosphate. Very, very interesting because glyphosate has a methyl phosphonate attached mm -hmm. to the nitrogen, which is, looks a whole lot like phosphate in terms of its shape and size. Fits into the spot where the phosphate where the substrate of a, of a molecule containing phosphate is supposed to fit, glyphosate occupies that space and prevents the substrate from fitting in anymore and ruins the protein's ability to do its job. So it becomes, it's an enzyme that becomes unable to, to perform its job. And then you have all, all kinds of problems. And so, so EPSP synthase exactly fits that model with a highly conserved glycine residue at the place where it binds phosphate. There's another enzyme called uh, uh, phosphoenopyruvate carboxykinase. PEPC, phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase. I wrote a lot about that in my book yes. because that, that enzyme has exactly the same model. It binds phosphate, it binds actually PEP, which is the same molecule that EPSP synthase binds. It binds PEP at a site where it has actually more than one highly conserved glycine residue. So if glyphosate were to substitute for those glycines, either of those glycines, it would mess things up and cause that enzyme not to work. And that enzyme turns out to be incredibly important in the liver incredibly important in the baby when it's first born uh, because it allows the um, liver to, to uh, convert fats and proteins into sugar. It allows it to do that quickly in response to low blood sugar. And so what happens when an enzyme isn't able to do its job quickly is that uh, when you, like say you're exercising a lot and you're burning a lot of energy, you haven't eaten in a while, your blood sugar goes low, your body's in panic mode. Oh, we got to get sugar. We got to get sugar, get this back and you can't do it. And then you can go into a coma because your blood sugar gets too low. So when you're, and this happens with a the baby, there's actually, you know, babies who are born and have this hypoglycemia, it can cause sudden death, sudden infant death, because the baby's uh, sugar drops too low and they go into a coma and die. And so um, the consequence of that is the body eventually regulates to raise the blood sugar level uh, constantly to always have it higher because it's anticipating this emergency situation that could come up. And that's how you get this kind of pre-diabetes state of high blood sugar, elevated blood sugar, um, pre-diabetes, uh, because your body, I think it's because your body's adjusting for this comp complication that the liver is not able to deliver quickly if the blood sugar gets too low. It, it sounds like glyphosate's like an imposter. In yes, exactly. A lot of areas where it just jumps in there pretends to be something else and then nothing can work right. Is yeah, it's a, it's a neurotransmitter too, because glycine is a neurotransmitter. Glycine is a very important molecule itself. And glyphosate can substitute for glycine as a neurotransmitter, which can really mess up uh, the, you know, these um, signaling of neurotransmitters. And so you have this, this problem of uh, excess uh, glutamate toxicity that you see uh, associated with glyphosate, which can really burn up the brain. I mean, I think that's associated with autism as well. Um, Ex ex glut glutamate excitotoxicity and glyphosate, if, if there's a glycine that triggers these reactions that glyphosate can pretend to be glycine and cause this uh, stimulation of these uh, pathways that cause um, uh, calcium entry and glutamate ex ex excitotoxicity and all these problems. So there've been several studies that have shown that glyphosate causes excess glutamate um, in the brain that can then burn out the neurons. And that I think is also connected to autism. Yes. And, and you uh, cited so many great research articles in your book that just will compel people to even look at things in the last year or so. And there's so much research just about depression, how it's, you know, uh, connected to memory loss, just, just all of that. Um, it was interesting to me, Dr. Seneff, how uh, glyphosate was originally a chelator uh, mm -hmm. to clean out pipes. And then 
it, they realized it was an herbicide. So it's a kind of a, a defoliant. They put it on, you know, wheat or things to help the harvest go faster. Then they uh, realized it was an antibiotic, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. it's actually been registered as an antibiotic. It's, yes, it has. It's the patent on, on the, and it's antimicrobial effects. That's even more shocking to me to think that uh, we are getting doused with antibiotics exactly every day. We know the power of the gut microbes. We know we're outnumbered, whatever uh, estimate of ten to one, and we we've, we've got to keep those little boogers happy so that they will do the things for us to keep us happy. Um, tell us uh, just more about the the gut microbe biome and and what you're finding i know you you said you're just studying so much even since you wrote the book of the copyrights 2021 so it's very recent mm -hmm. but um what's new in that area Brooke? yeah well there's a couple of things i can point out one is that uh you know when the when the microbes are exposed chronically to a low dose of an antibiotic uh, they can acquire resistance general resistance to antibiotics not just to that one but to other ones as mm -hmm. well and the studies have shown that chronic exposure to glyphosate can cause um, these bugs in your in your gut to um, to, to develop these efflux uh, proteins that can ship the toxins out, not just the glyphosate, but everything else as well. And so they become resistant to other antibiotics as a consequence of their chronic exposure to glyphosate. And we're seeing it. And of course, the cows are eating tons of glyphosate, and we've got a lot of issues with antibiotics. They're being given antibiotics as well, so they've got antibiotics being, you know, actually given to them as well as the glyphosate. And we're getting all these antibiotic resistant uh, uh, pathogens, you know, like, like, um, um, what's it called? Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Yeah. Have you heard yeah. of that? Right. Yeah. That's, Multiple that's one that we look resistant. for on the GI map. Yeah. Yeah. That's killing people in hospitals. Like getting, they come in with an, you know, a, a appendicitis and then they end up dead because they pick up a pseudomonas rucanosa in the hospital type of thing you know it's a very very serious problem and um, and so uh, salmonella as well for example mm -hmm. I mean, there's various um, uh, microbes that are developing resistance multiple resistant um, staph aureus strophe right yeah staph aureus right. MRSA yeah yeah and so um, resistant yeah Right. And then the other thing I want to talk about is the pH, because that's really interesting. I sort of worked that out with the uh, pH issue because this is and it's interesting. Yeah. And, and I found these studies, you know, were fascinating studies from quite long ago where they were finding out um, curious about the fact that the um, that the, the microbe mix was really changing a lot in the infants over time. You know, it used to be that the lactobacillus uh, and the bifidobacteria were really dominant. And then you started getting all these other microbes coming in at larger numbers. And then um, what they found out was the pH of the gut has been um, going up over time. So since 75, the, the, uh, the pH of the infant gut, they're looking at the infant, uh, was getting higher and higher, um, which is a really big problem because you need the low pH, uh, like acidic pH for these acid-loving microbes. And these acid-loving microbes in the gut, they produce a really critical short-chain uh, fatty acids. Uh, acetate, butyrate, and propionate. Mm -hmm. These are three short chain fatty acids that are super, super important for the mm -hmm. colon. And for the gut uh, and, lining, yeah. Yeah, because the, the, the colon uh, cells love butyrate. They love it. That's their favorite food. Mm -hmm. And it's made for them by those microbes that require the acid. So when the pH goes up, the butyrate goes way down. They've shown that experimentally. Not enough butyrate. And I think that's how you end up with colon cancer, which is another one of those conditions that's going up dramatically uh, in recent times you know, because of this disruption of the gut pH. It's so logical, Dr. Seneff. And you think about just leaky gut. You mean, no, but we never talked about leaky gut 30 years ago, I know. but now, you know, leaky gut is everywhere. Uh, so, so those, um, those bacteria that are food for the good cells are just not there. So holes develop in the gut lining uh, toxins get out into the bloodstream, the immune system reacts to those toxins. And there we have, you know, lots more autoimmunity. Um, That's you right. talked about that so well. In your yeah. Opinion. And it's more than that because the proteins are not getting properly digested and particularly proteins that have a lot of proline in them. That's another thing I talked about in my book, in my chapter on the gut, um, casein in milk and then gluten, of course, in wheat. Uh, those are two proteins that have a lot of proline. And proline is a difficult amino acid to break down with specialized enzymes. It, 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 it has extra, an extra carbon attached to its nitrogen, which makes it not work with the normal enzymes that can do all the other amino acids. 
So there's these specialized enzymes that break proline apart from the, from the paper doll chain. And, um, and these, uh, like lactobacillus has four or five different enzymes that specialize in, in, in proline. And um, so lactobacillus is getting killed off by, by glyphosate. And then the proline is not getting separated. And then these chains, these, these peptide, short peptide sequences are sticking around. They can't be broken down any further because it's stuck on the proline. And those are really, really problematic. That's what's causing, I think, the, the alarming rise in celiac disease. Celiac disease is going up exactly in the step of the rise in glyphosate usage on wheat, not corn and soy, but wheat. It matches celiac disease. And I wrote a paper on that together with Anthony Samsel. And you know, it's it was so weird. All of a sudden, I was hearing about gluten intolerance and all these gluten-free sections in the grocery store. You know, I've lived long enough to know that we didn't have that back then. I mean, it's only been like the last ten years or so that all of a sudden we've got all these people who can't eat gluten. It's so weird. Mm -hmm. And of course, wheat's being sprayed with glyphosate right before the harvest, and high levels of glyphosate are showing up in wheat-based products. To me, it's it's a no-brainer to say glyphosate is the primary cause of the epidemic. Again, gluten intolerance can be caused by other things, but glyphosate is the primary cause of the epidemic. I feel very confident in saying that in gluten intolerance that we're seeing today. And so when those proteins you know, don't get broken down, you've got, the, and also glyphosate causes the leaky gut. Uh, experiments have shown that experimentally, the glyphosate causes the leaky gut. And those short peptide chains get out into circulation. That's really the alarm bells for the immune system. It doesn't like to see these foreign proteins, foreign peptide sequences hanging out in the blood. That's bad news. And that's when it's going to develop antibodies to those to try to get them out, to, to be able to tag them and remove them. And then you have this process called molecular mimicry, where there's a human protein that has a sequence that's similar to, but not exactly the same as, or even sometimes exact match to some sequence that's in the, um, in the foreign protein. And then the, uh, the antibody makes a mistake and starts attacking the human protein. That's how you get lupus, you know, and multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, and of course, autism is probably also related to um, this kind of problem with um, uh, uh, the immune system attacking, for example, the myelin sheath in the brain as a consequence of, um, of these antibodies that are um, originally developed to match uh, these peptide sequences that couldn't get broken down because of this uh, defect in the... Uh, in the enzymatic digestion of these proteins. And that also raises the pH because those peptides make their way into the colon. And then they have to be broken down completely. They can no longer become amino acids that can supply the host because the host wants to have all these amino acids to make their own proteins. They, you eat the protein, you break it apart, you reassemble those amino acids into new proteins. If you can't break it apart, it ends up in the colon. And that nitrogen is going to nitrogen, you know, ammonia has an extremely high pH. So when you start making ammonia out of those uh, amino acids that are broken down completely because it can no longer be absorbed in the upper gut, uh, the, the amino acids are absorbed through the gut, but in the colon, they're not. The microbes are, have to be, have to break it all the way down. That's how you get ammonia, which raises the pH, which messes up the microbes, which causes the de deficiency in butyrate. I mean, it's a terrible cascade. Can totally see the the downstream effects that are horrible. Your your book sparked my interest in researching Fusobacterium nucleatum more fully. Um, my listeners know that's a bacteria that I talk about a lot. I jokingly call it the mother in law bacteria because it's it's a commensal bacteria. When it's in small quantities, it's a beneficial bacteria. But you know, when it overgrows, it becomes very dangerous. Just sort of like uh, if if me as a mother in law, if I go over and hang out um, too long and move my um, <laughs> like that. clothes around and interfere and give him unsolicited advice, then you know I become um, Fusobacterium nucleatum at a high level. So <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> so this, this bacteria, Dr. Seneff is just so interesting. It's an oral pathogen. It starts in the mouth, but it translocates to the gut. And, and it's really probably my main, in, main area of interest. Um, if I had to pick one, uh, love everything in the gut, but, but nevertheless, I, I feel like it's uh, such a key in terms of starting you know, starting a problem, starting a riot, uh, it, it's considered to be potentially causal in colon cancer. So when you started telling about all of these things you just described in the gut, I'm thinking, gee whiz, does this glyphosate make fusobacterium, you know, overgrow? Does, does glyphosate make fusobacterium turn mean? Um, 
does right i think that's a very interesting uh, statement and i have to confess that i don't know i haven't looked at fusobacterium but i'm gonna do so that, uh, based on your lead because that sounds really really interesting and i do wonder i i've talked about um desulfovibrio and, and vitophilia wadsworthia those are two uh also problematic uh, bugs that um produce hydrogen sulfide gas and and autistic kids often do have a problem with uh excess hydrogen sulfide gas in their gut and that one is an easy one to explain from glyphosate because glyphosate disrupts sulfur. It disrupts the ability to convert um, sulfide into sulfate and it can disrupts the ability to convert or inorganic sulfur into organic sulfur in the form of methionine. It, drop, it, it breaks that methionine pathway, which results in the, the only way to deal with the sulfide is to convert it to hydrogen sulfide gas. And the gas then can go anywhere in the body because it's very light. And it, and it spreads, it, it doesn't have to go in blood vessels. It can just diffuse through the cells, through the tissues. So it doesn't have to have a, a channel and it just spreads throughout the body. And hydrogen sulfide, of course, can kill you if you get too much in the brain, but it, it causes brain fog. Um, so we have some of these yeah. issues that people are experiencing, I think could well be due to too much hydrogen sulfide gas. Another thing I talk about in my book, but, um, but I, I want to look up those fusobacteria, see what it is exactly that they're doing. Are they producing some kind of toxins that are causing trouble or? Uh, they uh, they produce uh, these adhesins, and so they oh, sort yes, of adhesins. make other bacteria worse. Um, yeah, they do all kinds of bad things. I don't know about the production of 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 uh, yeah, because clostridia, of course, gas. produce a certain like picresol. Picresol is linked to autism, and that's produced by the clostridia, and the clostridia overgrow in the pr presence of glyphosate. So that's another angle where the picresol gets into the brain and actually disrupts the brain. So. Um, what I see clinically with my patients is they often, um, they often have, you know, brain fog. They often have mm. insulin resistance. Um, they often have autoimmunity. It is an autoimmune inducer, fusobacterium nucleotum. Um, so everything you talk about, it's all connected. When you think about glyphosate, mm. I mean, I think it's just really baseline. It's, it's yes. contributing to cancer. It's contributing to uh, memory loss. It's contrib contributing to, you know, every autoimmune disease we can think of. And I guess they're adding more to the list all the time. Um, it's just this, this crazy autoimmune storm that we have these days. Uh, and, and everything's connected to everything else. Yes. It's, um, and I think it's your, your, the point you make about, um, the ability to break down gluten and casein is yes. so big because, you know, here we are back to relationships when people go to, you know, their family dinner and they can't eat the homemade noodles yeah. that granny made, you know, that I impacts know. it's so, people. it's so terrible. It's amazing how many, it gets complicated to have a dinner party because this, this person has this, uh, you know, all these different uh, sensitivities, these different foods, it's hard to come up with a, uh, a dinner that's going to work for everybody. You know? it, does. <laughs> so it is it's really gotten complicated. It really, really is. Um, you talk about pregnancy in your book. And I think, I don't know, but I'm going to ask you, is this why you called it toxic legacy? Uh, I, get, yes. I know you're just a family oriented person and you care about people from every age, but this explain Absolutely. what you talked about oh. in the book, because this, this impacts future generations that blue. It really does. It's very scary. Actually, some really interesting studies have come out just in the last few years on glyphosate um, in, in rats, in mice, you know, they do these studies where they expose the, uh, the pregnant uh, rat um, to very low doses of glyphosate while they're pregnant, a critical period of pre pregnancy, they know which period to look for. These people have figured this out. And it's the germline is really quite interesting because the female fetus produces her eggs before she produces her brain. I mean, it's very early during development, the eggs are created. And those eggs are very, very sensitive to toxic exposures. And th those toxic exposures alter the epigenetics of the eggs. The epigenetic um, epigenetics is beyond the genome. It's, it's not just the, the DNA code can stay the same, but there's these methylation pathways, you know, there's various modifications that happen um, to the genome that happen differently in the presence of these poisons. And there's a memory involved in that that can last through several generations. And so what they found was quite extraordinary when they exposed these pregnant, I can't remember if it was mice or rats. I think it was mice um, to, I always mix those two up in the studies, but I think it was mice. They exposed these mother, mothers, they were pregnant. Um, they were fine. They didn't see anything wrong with them. Their offspring seemed to be fine too. When they were born, they were fine. 
they grew up, they had their own, they went through uh, multiple generations and every generation got worse in terms of all these different problems with autoimmune diseases and reproductive issues. You know, the, the next generation had problems with um, stillbirth and, and uh, premature, you know, a shortened um, gestation period. And then they had various kidney problems. There were just a lot of issues that showed up in the later generations as a consequence of that exposure to their great grandmother. I mean, it was just amazing that it could be remembered that far back. And I think we're seeing that now because we're starting to get into second generation, third generation. We've had glyphosate's been around since 1975. And I think things are gonna get worse before they get better uh, because we're starting, it's starting to really catch up with us that you're, the mother has already been exposed in utero and now she's having her child, you know, we're getting into that phase with the kids now um, having more problems. You know, we've got, America's got a terrible record. But we just, I just found out there's like a 40 or 40% or maybe even 40%, I think, increase in um, maternal mortality just this past year oh, in the United goodness. States. Oh, my goodness, Dr. Seneff. Well, and PCOS, all this infertility. PCOS is very interesting. And in fact, um, that's polycystic ovary syndrome. That's a, a a huge problem and it's actually the main uh the biggest problem associated with female infertility and there was a study done very recently again there's been a lot of great studies coming out recently on glyphosate i think the uh, researchers are starting to realize this stuff is, is toxic you know they used to think well why would i study glyphosate it's perfectly fine i won't find anything i'll just waste my money now they're realizing that it is toxic and so there's lots of studies coming out recently i'm really glad about that but this study uh, was very interesting on female babies, it was looking at female babies, and they happen to know that uh, you can measure, is a measure you can use, it's called the anogenital distance, you can imagine what that might be mm -hmm. in the infant, and um, when, it's, when it's long, it's an indicator of excess exposure to testosterone in utero, they knew, they know that. Oh my goodness. And then they found yeah. out that they, they did this measure on these babies, and they found out that there was a statist statistically significant correlation between the length of, of that metric and the uh, amount of glyphosate in the urine of the mother during pregnancy, they found a statistically significant correlation. And when you have that condition, uh, that metric, um, it's, it's a risk factor, tremendous risk factor for PCOS because you have too much testosterone in utero and you're sort of, you're, you're, um, there's more, uh, more male-like hormones. You get right. PCOS has a lot of extra hair and I mean, it's sort of more masculine-like, uh, too much testosterone. And uh, glyphosate uh, disrupts the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. And so I think that's part of its uh, problem with developmental uh, exposures during in utero when the baby's being developing and trying to figure out male, female, you know, and so the males are getting too much testosterone, which is causing sort of a super male and the females are getting too much testosterone as well, which is causing this PCOS polycystic ovary syndrome, often having problems with irregular periods and uh, infertility, uh, just a lot of issues around the reproductive system as a consequence of, of that. And then the, the people who have PCOS have an increased risk to autism and they, their children also have an increased risk to autism. Oh, I didn't know their children did. Wow. And I know they're, they have way, a, a very high increased uh, risk of diabetes, type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. That's right. I saw mm -hmm. that too. Mm -hmm. Oh my so. goodness. It's, it's so, um, it's so fascinating. So clarify for us, um, how we can, you know, <laughs> right. ward this off. That. And it's a real loaded question here. Uh, you know, is so, so my, my first question would be when you buy something that says GMO, uh, what's that really mean? Right. And of course we have things that are saying non-GMO, they're advertising non-GMO. United States refuses to introduce a labeling for GMO, which, which they have in Europe where you can know this is, uh, G this product contains GMOs. And GMOs, of course, are genetically modified organisms. And uh, there's, that's been a big boon in uh, agriculture where they've been able to go in and insert bacterial genes into the plant's genome uh, that causes it to be, uh, uh, in one case, for example, the, uh, the BT toxin, they produce this, they add a gene that produces a toxin that's uh, normally produced by some insect that, or some uh, bacterium, I guess, BT, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a bacterium or a microorganism of some sort. Um, but they put that genome into the plant. So the plants, the corn, for example, BT corn produces uh, this toxin, which supposedly, which kills the insects, but it supposedly um, doesn't harm us, which I don't believe either. But, and then of course, but the main GMO is the anti-glyphosate GMO, Roundup Ready crops. That's been a big boon in agriculture. We've got the GMO corn, soy, canola, sugar beets, 
uh, alfalfa, those are and cotton. Those are the main crops uh, that have this GMO uh, engineered to be able to resist glyphosate. And so you can just spray glyphosate all over the crop. It doesn't die. Uh, it picks up the glyphosate, incorporates it into its tissue. So you can't wash it off. And of course it incorporates, I think, into its proteins. It's just impossible mm -hmm. to get rid of that glyphosate in the, in the food you're eating. And then tests have been done mostly by, you know, activists. This hasn't been the U.S. government. The US, as far as I know, the U.S. government has only tested soy and only in one year. And I remember what year it was, something like 2011. I forget. One year. Maybe it was more recent than that. 2000. I shouldn't make it up. I don't remember. There was one year in which the U.S. government tested soy and they tested some 300 samples of soy. And they found glyphosate or its breakdown product, AMPA, in over 96% of the samples. Oh, my goodness. And they so reported it, it. And then they said, of course, it doesn't matter because glyphosate is safe. But there it is. It's in the soy. So if it, if it says non-G, if it doesn't say anything, you know it's GMO, correct? But if it says, then you look for non-GMO. So can you trust non-GMO? No. And if it says non-GMO, then it can be wheat, right? It can be oats. It can be uh, uh, legumes like uh like um, chickpeas and garbanzo beans or, or um, sunflower seeds, all of those things are being sprayed right before the harvest as a desiccant. You mentioned that earlier. That, that's something I hadn't realized. Actually, when I first started studying glyphosate, I was thinking GMO and I didn't realize that they were also using it. Sugarcane is another one. They use it on all these crops right before harvest. So that those are actually showing up. The foods that contain those uh, sources are showing up with higher levels on average of glyphosate than the ones that are GMO. So it's quite interesting because the GMO is being sprayed throughout the year, but these crops are being sprayed right before the harvest. So it's very, you know, very recently. Wow. And so the non-GMO is, is not a good label because you might as well ignore it. I don't even care whether they ever introduce that, you know, because what, we, what you need is certified organic. And I, when we shop, we always buy certified organic. We're very religious about it at this point and I have been for several years and, uh, and it's been reflected in our improved health as well. Now just switching to, not, I, I would encourage everybody to switch to certified organic. That's, that's the most important thing you can do uh, to improve your health, I believe. And of course, you're not get, just getting rid of glyphosate, you're getting rid of all those insecticides. And of course, the GMOs, none of that can be in there if it's certified organic. It's a much stronger label than non-GMO. Well, one of the things in your book, these, all these pesticides and herbicides and, you know, chemicals all work together synergistically uh, to make each other worse, potentially. Yes. But in your book, you have the last chapter is great. You guys, it talks about strategies and they're all strategies that we can do. It's, it's nothing, you know, crazy. One that I love Dr. Seneff is like, go play in the mud, go yeah. get, get <laughs> your bare feet on the ground, yes. you know, do Grounded. some earthing get in the, get in the salt water. It's yeah. Just... I love walking in the beach at the beach in the water on a sunny day, you know, with the breeze, it's just, it's fun first of all. Um, but it's very, very healthy because you're getting the grounding, you're getting sunlight. Of course, I'm a big fan of sunlight exposure. I really think that can help uh, a lot with health and it's completely free. So there's no reason not to do it, you know? Um, and uh, don't wear sunscreen. Sunscreen is actually toxic. It's got aluminum in it. A lot, a lot of the sunscreens have aluminum and that'll soak right through the skin and mess up uh, critical enzymes that are involved with maintaining healthy skin. So uh, I think that, you know, sunscreen use has been going up dramatically in step with the rise in skin cancer oh, and, me and melanoma. Yeah, it's pretty weird. You know, we're, we're, we think sunscreen's protecting us, but actually I think it's part of the problem with melanoma because it's messing up. The body's natural mechanisms of course you've got the problem with glyphosate too because glyphosate um, is disrupting the supply of melanin which is a skin tanning agent and also tryptophan plays an important role in protecting from the uv light so they're both being uh, affected by glyphosate so um, i think uh, i suspect that our sensitivity to the sun increased a rate of skin cancers connected to glyphosate as well as to sunscreen no, I agree. And then you're not getting all the good vitamin D that we really, our bodies know how to utilize. We're way too scared of that. Um, yes. And I want to just... mention sunglasses as well, because that's one that I think people are being trained to wear sunglasses and even put sunglasses on their little two-year-old child to protect them from the sun. I think that's a big mistake. And again, glyphosate affects the eyes. There's studies that, on animals that have shown that it goes to the eyes and damages them and probably disrupts their ability the eye's ability to protect themselves from the sun. That's why we've gotten sort of obsessed with sunglasses. 
but I think sunglasses are bad. Uh, the, the eyes um, receive the sunlight, it goes to the pineal gland and it, it allows the pineal gland to make sulfate, which then is needed to make melatonin sulfate. You know, the melatonin is sulfated before it's released into the uh, cerebrospinal fluid at night to help you sleep. The melatonin and the sulfate are really important nutrients for the brain to help it clear the garbage. So all of that gets messed up by both the glyphosate and the lack of sunlight exposure to the eyes. Wow, that is fascinating information because uh, I always feel bad because I usually can't find my sunglasses. <laughs> and uh, so now I won't even feel guilty about that. I'll just, I'll just know that I'm doing the best thing to not have my sunglasses. Mm. Thank you. Uh, it, what else? What else can we do? Like, what can we do today? Well, we can... you, you mentioned probiotics and I think they're wonderful. So, and I love this idea of making your own. That's really great. But uh, yeah, we like sauerkraut and we use uh, apple cider vinegar. We make our own salad dressing. Um, my husband does that. <laughs> he's the cook in the family. And that's good. So Victor is mine. Is. Yeah, so that's, that's really great. They support um, us in, uh, in what we're doing. So it's, it's wonderful. I know. It's really great. He's been really sweet. And of course, he had a super powerful career for many years. And now he's kind of in his later phases of that career and has more time. And he's very devoted. He's been great for helping to maximize the amount of time I can spend on this, which is I'm very grateful to him for that. So um Shout out to Victor. <laughs> Love that. Yes, Victor. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, evidence of a great relationship and all the things you're doing to maintain your vitality. I, I knew you would be just loaded with vitality, Dr. Seneff, uh, as I've you know, followed you and uh, just been so uh, highly ad admiring all of your work, all of your bravery, bravery all of your curiosity and mm -hmm. knowing that you're doing this, um, you know, with some pushback. Um Right. Yes. With uh -huh. a lot of pushback. Uh, so hopefully, uh, if your time permits, I'd love to have you back to talk about vaccines. I would uh, love to do that. Yeah, I would I love to. to. Our listeners would love that. Um, so I, I just thank you so much for taking time today. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough. If I could reach across and give you a giant hug, I would. <laughs> and uh, so I'm sending you one. And um, and thank you to all you listeners. Thank you for sharing uh Vitality Made Simple. You all know that I'm a, a social media introvert, and uh, but we're now in 83 countries. We, we picked up another country this uh, week, and um, you know this is information everybody in the whole world needs uh, about glyphosate. So share it, share it, share it. Uh, just make one little small change. It's going to improve your vitality span. It's going to improve your relationships, and that's what it's all about. Uh, thanks for listening. Blessings until next time. 